The last application we'll look at here is to vibrations, and this will be a second order differential equation we'll see set up here. So we'll start with what's called a mass spring damper system. All that means is that there's some mass that's vibrating and it's controlled by a spring and a damper. So I've got a picture here of a shock like you would see on a bicycle, a motorcycle for instance, or if you looked at the suspension of your car, it would be basically the same setup, although it would look a little bit different. But you've got a coiled spring wrapped around a damper, or you might call that the shock itself. Really the shock is the whole system, but the damper is similar to a air pump. If you've ever taken a bicycle pump, for instance, as you push on the plunger, you feel some resistance, right? And it turns out that resistance is based on how quickly you try pushing on the plunger. If you slowly compress it, it moves fairly easily. But if you give it a hard push very quickly, it resists you and you feel that resistance and that uh, dampening of your force. So inside that there's a uh, membrane that has small gaps for air to pass through or some other fluid if there's another fluid inside and so there's sort of a idealized version of that drawn here where that's your damper and that's dampening the force that's coming from this. The spring acts like you're used to springs acting, it resists force and as we've talked about at the beginning of the semester the spring's force depends on how far you compress it or stretch it. So the force that the spring exerts depends on its position and the force that the damper exerts depends on its velocity. The two combined make a shock that will even out or dampen out vibrations and that's kind of the goal of a suspension system. And of course if you study this more you'll learn how to tune suspension systems whether you're looking for performance or for smoothness and there's all sorts of interesting things you can learn about shocks and suspensions and so on. So I've got this idealized version drawn here and it's drawn sideways but don't let that mess you up. You can think about the mass for instance as your car and then the spring and the damper are connecting your car to the ground through the wheel and together they form your suspension. The spring and the damper work in concert with one another. So we're measuring a function x which is the position and there's some equilibrium position for this and that's based on the length of the spring. If your car is just sitting in the parking lot its position is at equilibrium and that depends on how your suspension is set up, the length of that spring. But then if you start driving it, it will compress or extend depending on how the road behaves and you can measure the position over time. And what will happen is, for a very simple system, let's say we took this mass and we moved it to the right and then we let go. The spring would pull it back to the left and it would pull it beyond the equilibrium position. So if you pulled this out, the spring would want to bring it back in and then it would move past the equilibrium position before the spring reacted and pushed on it back and so there would be this oscillation back and forth. But over time that oscillation would slowly settle down and that damper would help to slow things down and to make everything settle down. So we could draw a graph for instance of the position over time If we started out at some position to the right, so x is positive, and then we let go, the position would look something like this, where it would oscillate back and forth, but it would oscillate in a reducing manner. And so the amplitude of that oscillation reduces over time. And it turns out, depending on how this is tuned, that you can sometimes see an exponential shape to that dampening. So when we get to solving second order equations, it'll turn out that we'll find some cases have an exponential component to them and a trig component to the solution, a sine or cosine function, which you can see in those oscillations.
So some of that we'll get to discuss and some of it we'll leave for other courses. But for now, we're just gonna look at how we can find this position as a function of time. The starting point for this is Newton's second law of motion, which says that F equals MA as long as mass is constant, force equals mass times acceleration. If mass is changing, it's a little bit more complicated, but still very similar to that. And then we're gonna think about the forces on this mass. So if this thing is sitting at equilibrium, there's no forces on it, so it'll stay there. But if it gets moved, it'll have some forces acting on it. First of all, the spring will act on it with a force of negative kx. k times x, that's Hooke's law. Force equals the spring constant times the displacement. And then the negative is because if the mass is moved to the right, the spring will pull it in the opposite direction. If the mass is moved to the left, the spring will push it in the opposite direction. So the spring force always opposes the direction that it's been pulled or pushed. Then the damper, as I mentioned, the force of the damper, as with a bicycle pump, depends on the speed or the velocity that this thing is moving with. So that will have a constant C, depending on the conditions of the damper, how it's tuned, times X prime. That will also be negative because that force also opposes the motion. If the mass is moving to the left, the damper is fighting that motion. If the mass is moving to the right, the damper is still fighting that motion. So it's always opposing the direction of X prime. And then there may be some external force to this. Which we can call F of T. So if you add up all of those forces, negative kx plus negative cx prime plus f of t, all of that equals mass times acceleration, and we know that acceleration is the second derivative of position, mx double prime. We can rearrange this a little bit to write it in a more familiar form. And that's our first example of a second order differential equation, which we will learn how to solve soon. In a given problem like this, M, C, and K would all be given to us. We would know the mass of the object, we would know the spring constant, we would know the damper constant, and if there's some external force, we would have a way of measuring that as well. And then we could solve using some of the methods we'll learn when we learn how to solve second order equations. It turns out, although we won't take the time to do this, that there's a similar approach for electrical engineering if instead of a mechanical system with a mass, a spring, and a damper, if you draw a simple circuit with voltage and current and conductance and so on, if you have a resistor and a few other elements, you can build a differential equation that looks exactly like this except instead of a mass, spring, and a damper, M, C, and K, you have different constants that relate to your system. But the structure of the equation and the method of solving is exactly identical. So a mechanical vibration system and a simple circuit actually are parallels and they have the same structure to their, to their differential equation and to the solution of it. So it's kind of interesting and if you want to study more on that you can find an example of that as well.